Last week we we looked at a uh, we, we gave you a question. What do you do when you fail God? Well, there's a lot of things that we might say we might do, or we've seen Christians do, or um, others uh, in the world do when they fail. But you see, in Genesis 13, we see Abraham, or Abram there, in verses 1 through 4, uh, he gets back, <clears throat> he get, comes out of Egypt, he gets back into Canaan land, he's back in the will of God, he's back in the place of blessing. He's back in fellowship with God because you see uh, the characteristics of Abraham is, remember we said, he's a pilgrim and stranger and the hallmarks of Abram is going to be this. He's going to set up a tent, he's going to set up an altar, and he's going to call upon the name of the Lord. And you think about that for a minute. Isn't that like every Christian does? If they're a true believer? We're, we're pilgrims and strangers, we have a tent as it were, we, we have an altar, uh, the Lord Jesus, but we understand that we have family worship, we come before Him, we're a believer priest, and we call upon the name of the Lord. And here this morning, we're corporately coming together to call upon the name of the Lord. So Abram is back in fellowship. But you see, uh, this little trip down to Egypt, getting out of the will of God, uh, sinning, we know that the Lord will graciously forgive us, bring us back into fellowship. But there's always consequences. And sometimes the Lord takes away the consequences, doesn't He? He does. Sometimes He doesn't. Because He's going to use those consequences, those, those uh, mess-ups, those, those things that we brought into our lives, that extra baggage, He's going to use that to perfect us even further. So when He says all things work together for good, He's in all things. All things. Now that doesn't give us the justification to sin. The grace may abound. No, no. But we have a confidence that God is going to work out all things for our good. Even the bad things. Even the things where we depart, like Abraham here. Abraham. Uh, look at, if you want to read uh, verses 5 through 7. Genesis 13, 5 through 7. And not also which went with Abram and had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt there in the land. And so we, we see this, this aspect of riches, okay? Pharaoh prospered in a sense. Abram and Lot, they're down in Egypt. They come out with great riches. And now we see this, this new circumstance or this new well, this strife between uh, uh, Lot, uh, herdsmen, and Abram's herdsmen. And, uh, but see, God is going to use this strife, this, these riches, to retest Abram. You see, uh, the lesson is not learned yet. Remember, uh, the Lord implied by the promises that this is your land, Abram. You stay in this land, but a famine came along and, and Abram succumbed to human reasoning and whatever it may be. We talked about that. We studied that out. And he went down to Egypt and uh, uh, now he's back in the promised land. But you see, his lesson is still on the, on the table, as it were. Is God's, is God's grace sufficient? Is God's grace sufficient even when it comes to a situation like strife, disfellowship among these, this, this issue, okay? Uh, how would Abram solve the problem and still stay in the land and trust God to work it out? Remember, we ended last week. Uh, Abram needed the wisdom of God. <laughs> so do we. We went to James and we looked at, talked about the wisdom that, that is from above, okay? And we said, well, that's what we need. And I believe that's what we're going to see. Uh, God's grace is sufficient to give Abram wisdom. Wisdom. Okay? You know, like we say, well, if we were in the world, what we do? Well, we duke it out and the last man standing? Then, well, that's the one who... But it's interesting. One, one commentator said, you know, the strike was between the herdsmen of Lot and Abram. How long would it take the strike between Abram and Lot? Left undone. You know, ignore it. It'll go away. It won't. It won't. And so we need God's wisdom. We need God's grace. 
and I believe this is how Abram is, is going to work it out. So let's look how, how Abram dealt with this uh, temptation or trial, because it is, okay? Here's strife. Uh, he's back on the land. What am I going to do? And I think what we need to first of all consider and uh, see what Abram is up against, okay? And that's where we have to take a moment and, and look at Lot. Now we're not going to, in detail, we'll get back to Lot another time, but, but I want you to see uh, the, the issues here that Abram is facing and why he needs wisdom and why he needs grace, okay? In weakness, he, he needs to know what to do. And so Lot and his mindset after coming out of Egypt, okay? Look at verse 5. Genesis 13, verse 5. And Lot also which went with Abram and flocks had flocks and herds and what? Tents. That's significant. Okay? You, when you ever see Abram, he has one tent. One tent. And again, the idea, you know, whenever Abram is, you know, in fellowship with God, you'll see him at his tent, you'll see he does an altar, you'll see him calling upon the name of the Lord. But you see here, it, it says tents. And so, uh, a lot has got a taste of riches, prosperity. He's got a good taste of the world. And we know the, 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 the whole story about Lot. See, for Lot, you'll never see, in a sense, a tent, a pilgrim, stranger attitude. You'll never see an altar, and you never see Lot calling upon the name of the Lord. And that's where, where some, you know, many, but you know, there are those that say, well, Lot was a carnal Christian. Uh, I, don't, I don't go there, but I don't believe that. But, you know, if it wasn't for 2 Peter 2, 7 through 9, let me read that to you. We, would, we wouldn't know that Lot was actually a Christian or a believer. Okay? Notice it says 2 Peter 2, verse 7. And this is how it uh, talks about the promise of how God delivers. His grace is sufficient. And deliver just Lot, that's with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So here's just Lot, righteous Lot, godly Lot, okay? He is a believer. He's an Old Testament saint. He's a believer. But if you look at uh, the decisions that he makes, oh, wow. There's a lot to learn from Lot, not to do what Lot did, okay? But see, I want you to see what, what Abram is facing. Now, in Genesis uh, 13, if you're back there, look at verse 10 and 11. We're again looking at Lot for a minute to see his mindset. Okay, what it does his heart desire? And, what's, and verse 10 says, And Lot lifted up his eyes. This is after Abram says, Okay, Lot, uh, you go to the left, I'll go to the right. You go to the right, I'll go to the left. You know, he says, just, you, you pick out the man first, okay? And uh, verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, even where before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zorah. And so, Zorah, you see where Lot's mindset is. You know, like this, like the thought is, well, you can be, you can be out of Egypt, but you know, will Egypt be out of you? The children of Israel were delivered in the Exodus, and they came out of Egypt. But you know, but Egypt was in them, and how hard that is. And we see that in Lot, Lot's case, his, his measuring stick is his experience down in Egypt. And so we see a little about Lot and his mindset and what Abram is up against. But notice how. Abram solves this crisis, this issue, and still stays on the land. Now, notice this is, this is so important. Look at verses 8 through 9, Genesis 13. Look what Abram says here. Genesis 13, 8 and 9. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy my herdsmen, and thy herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. For if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now, 
And the question you ought to ask or think about for a moment is, whose land is it? Whose land has this been promised to? Well, it wasn't Lot. It was Abram. Okay? Why is he giving Lot first choice? Would you give Lot first choice? I mean, you know, think of the older person. He's, he's Uncle Abram. And here's, you know, nephew uh, Lot there. And, uh... Now, notice what, uh, how Abram is going to solve this problem. And again, it's because of God's grace is sufficient and God's wisdom, okay? Uh, notice, first of all, the two reasons why he gives. First of all, he says, because, we're, because other people are watching. Boy, isn't that a good deterrent? The world is watching. Verse 7. It says, the, the uh, Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt there in the land. So they were watching a lot. They were watching Abram. They were watching their herdsmen. They said, oh, these, these guys call themselves believer, believers. And look at the strife. And so the first thing that Abram says, is, says there's people watching us. We, we shouldn't be doing this. Okay? And secondly, he says in verse 8, we are brethren. Wow. We are brethren. You see, that these should be deterrents. And think of just that for a minute. Just those two issues. Just those two points. How much wisdom is in that? How, think of the average church, for example. If we had just those two points. Uh, you know, not just say that we're going to be hypocrites and put on a show. But, you know, uh, remember, Abram went down to Egypt. He, he messed up his testimony for sure, didn't he? He lied. He lied. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, the testimony for Pharaoh, the testimony for the princes, the testimony for Lot. And, you know, but now, you know, he's saying, you know, if others are watching and we're brethren, there, could, there should not be strife. We should work these things out. I'm reminded of what the Corinthians did there in 1 Corinthians. Apostle Paul is saying, why are you taking a brother or sister to the court. You're going to the world, to the worldly courts, and you're trying to solve uh, these issues that you have. And we do have issues, right? He says, isn't there anybody wise? Any, and can anybody in the church determine this? Get the, get the least person, the least person that's a Christian, as in your estimate. They should have enough wisdom to work this out between you. So I see this as good. Why didn't Abram choose to let, let Lot have the first choice? In a sense, I see, I see uh, Abram humbling himself in a way to solve the problem. You see, often as uh, Christians, we, we put it, you know, it's our rights. You know, this is my rights. I'm, I'm, you know, put me first. But we see in solving the problem, Abram is not putting himself first. Okay? We, we can look at Lot, and, there, and you know, the comparison is, is really, uh, it can go a long way. Um, Genesis 13, verse 10, we said, you know, Lot is lifting his eyes up to, to the well plains, of, the well watered plains of Jordan. He, he reminded of Egypt, he's, all that. And uh, uh, that's where his heart is. And then, uh, and then uh, it doesn't, uh, doesn't say for Abram to lift up his eyes until after Lot and Abram separates, okay? But the idea is, is, is Lot is looking, okay, me first. What can I get out of? Now, could you imagine, like I said last time, says, Lot, I mean, Lot, you, um, Abram, uh, you can have, you pick whatever you want. And, and I guess Lot would say, are you a little bit loco, Abram? This is, you know... Boy, this guy is old. He must be, you know, he's giving me the first choice. He's giving me the best. You know how that is, right? I'll take it all I can get. That's human nature. Human nature. What does uh, such an action convey as we see uh, Lot and Abram here? We see their mindsets. We see their ruling, des ruling desires. For Lot, you know, um, what was Lot's desire? Well, it said he pitched his tent towards Sodom. And the idea is that, you know, see, Lot is looking for a city whose builder and maker is man, not God. Verse 12. He's looking at the well-watered plains of Jordan. Reminds him of Egypt. Are we not reminded? You know, it says, uh, the Apostle John says, love not the world. 
You say, well, what's in the world? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and pride of life. All these things are in the world, but not of the Father. And, and, and so, no, no. Uh, we see Lot's mindset, the love of the world. And we'll leave off Lot here for the moment. But I want to give you an example here. Where does Lot end up when, it, when he's done? In a cave. That should really, you know, put some red flags up. He, he was a believer. Okay? But you see, an important one that we want to look at is Abram. Okay? So let's get back to Abram. See, we don't find any place where it says that, you know, God told Abram to do this. Give Lot the first choice. But we see God rewarding Abram for this, for obedience, for humility. For sacrificing, putting his brethren first in their need and want. Do you see that? You see, God's, you know, we're talking about just shall live by faith. We, believe, we say Abraham is the prototype of faith, you know, how God saves the believer. And you see, but faith in God's spirit also what? Sanctifies us, right? Sanctifies us. Makes us like God in character and conduct. And so uh, we can see that Abram is, is putting Lot, uh, allowing Lot to do this first, okay? Um, it's Abram's heart and mindset. We think of the, the word joy, right? J-O-Y. You want joy this morning? Well, put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. And you'll have joy. Isn't that how it works? Now, you think about Abram and say, well, I don't know if I would have been like Abram. Well, what was Abram looking for? Now, well, he didn't lift his eyes up till later, till God tells him to, okay? But notice, uh, it's, we have already mentioned this. Let me read it to you again. Hebrews 11, verse 10. This is Abram. For he looked for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews 11, 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. You see, when, when you know, he's, the Lord's going to tell Abram to look up. But you see, the whole idea is that Abram is not looking for a, a rich city or riches here. You see, he, 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 he says the Lord of glory appeared unto him. I mean, that's what brought him out of Ur of Chaldeans. There was no idol. You know, this is the Lord of glory. And, and, and it pressed upon his heart that wherever this God is, I want to be part of him. I want to be in fellowship with him. You see, the, you know, we're talking about counting the cost. Well, uh, I want to walk with the Lord Jesus. And uh, there's nothing more uh, worthy or more prize worthy or more valuable than the Lord Jesus. Isn't that true this morning? But the world will come in and flesh will come in and and get us sidetracked and distract us. But Abram, he, 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 he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Okay? Lot wanted uh, to possess the best now. Or at least what he thought was the best. You see, both men made a choice. And that's what we do as Christians, right? Lot... Uh, Abram made a choice to lie and go down to, to down to Egypt, right? Now we were talking about maybe like a baby believer, you know, and you know, you know, there's old habits that need to be unlearned, and you know, uh, you know, in the sense that God is that's why God is trying Abram. Okay, He's going to try your faith, why? To see to show you that God's grace is sufficient in every aspect, in every aspect. Not to lean to our own understanding, not try to work it out ourselves without God. Wait on God. Oh, I hate that. But see, that's where the blessing is, right? That's where we learn. Both men made a choice as the problem was before them. Now, I was thinking, you know, Abram takes the initiative. He says, look, you choose the best. Whatever you want, Lot. What if Lot came back and said, no, 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 no. You know, we can't separate Abram. You know, uh, no, no, I'll get my herdsmen in line and you get your herdsmen in line there and and uh, you know maybe we need to get rid of some of these cows and cattle and possessions and tents and you know get back to when we used to fellowship instead of fight I don't see Lot doing that 
I don't see many Christians doing that, do you? But that's where the blessing is. That's what we're called to. You know, it talks about preserving the unity of the Spirit. It's already here. You see, it's not something that we have to manufacture. It's just something that we have to maintain and cherish and nurture between brother. Okay? But notice here, something with Abram, his choice, I'm going to stay in the land. <laughs> I'm going to stay in the land. Okay? Uh, there in chapter 13, look at verse 11 through, thir 11 through 13. Chapter 13, verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. There's their choice, his choice. And Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan. Now, notice again, the, the emphasis that God Holy Spirit is making. You know, Lot went his way, Abram stayed in the land. But uh, Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Notice here, I just, for the note, one last thing for Lot, you see, God's evaluation of Lot's neighbors was not good. Didn't Lot care? Didn't Lot care? You know, there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole message on, you know, uh, where do I live? Where do I move my residence, you know? Uh, you know, I get, you know, I often tell people, and I believe this is so true. You see, if you say, well, I, God has given me a new job, I say, Amen. God bless you. Well, i got to move away, Pastor. I said, okay. Uh, is there a good local church in the area? Well, is it God's will for you to take that job? I would advise you no. Some people look at me like, you've got, you got to be kidding me. You know, I'm going to pass up this to the job? I've seen truck drivers that, that, that talk, you know, when I used to do the truck stop in the streets there, preaching and the truck driver, just like the, the situation that Brian Solution is in, you know. He's home, you know, three, four weeks. You know, he's out on the road four or five weeks. Comes home one weekend, off on the road again. And these ones would come in and say, and these truck drivers would come in and say, and I, and I encourage the truck drivers to just try to get local, take less money, be at home, and be in church. And, and they knew. That's what I meant when I told them. But you see, one, I remember there was one guy who was in the truck side. He'd stand up and said, uh, Brother, I got, a, I got a test. God has given me this job. and It's more money per, uh, uh, per, per mile and, and uh, uh, good track. And he said, Well, uh, you're going to be home soon? Or, you know, uh, what about being home? He said, Well, that's, that's the problem. That's, that's something I have to deal with. Uh, it's going to be out on the road longer. To the choices you make, you see, Lot is looking after the eyes of the flesh, you know, the pride of life. And, and we see, uh, you know, that, again, that's a whole different message. But you see, God says, your neighbors are wicked, Sodom. I mean, uh, Lot, don't go that way. <laughs> but it doesn't stop Lot. Let's look at real quick here. As we see the reward of Abram's faith. You say, was Abram out to uh, get a reward? Was he out to you know, save himself by his works? No, he, he's acting in faith. Okay? I mean, remember, God didn't say, Abram, I want you to give Lot the first choice. In a sense, Abram came up with it on his own, but I, I believe it's God's grace working. I believe it's uh, uh, by faith he's working. You know, he, he, he sees, uh, Abram sees what's more more important, okay? And uh, and so he's not out just to, you know, we don't do things just to get rewards, do we? No. But we will be rewarded. And it's the abundance of His grace, okay? That's just amazing. God saves us by His grace, He gives us good works to do, and then He rewards us as good stewards in the end. That's God, okay? But it's never a matter of earning our salvation or putting our minds on the rewards, okay? I'm going to get so much money, and then God will give me so much money back. That's immature. Immature. But look at uh, the reward of Abram here in a minute. But I want to give you a key verse, okay? And I think this is what Abram is practicing. Hebrews 11.6. 
Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, if you think about someone else in the Hebrew uh, Hall of Faith, Moses, when he forsook Egypt, he, 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 he said, talks about the recompense of of reward. He, he saw he who was invisible and he knew that you know Christ was worth it. God will make it all worthwhile. I'll leave Egypt behind. I'll leave all this power and position behind and God will make it all worthwhile. Maybe not in this life but surely in the next. That's Moses' mindset. That's what Abram here is doing. Notice here in, uh, as we get to chapter 13 in verses 14 through 18, that's where we're at, verses 14 through 18. First of all, Abram passed the test, didn't he? You see, that's, what, that's why our faith is tried, so we would pass the test. Now, it's not the best solution for Lot, at least, but didn't Lot really know better? You know, uh, maybe he needed to hang out with Abram a little bit longer. And he said, well, Abram was the one who went down to Egypt. Well, you see, it's like they, they talk about King David. You see, the only talk about King David is he, he sinned. He, an adulteress and a murderer. They never talk about King David's repentance and godly sorrow. You see, and, and uh, sure, you know, Abram uh, really messed up or influenced, influenced Lot in the wrong way. But you see, Abram does pass the test. It's a test of humility. It's a test that God's grace is sufficient. Divine wisdom. You see, Abram had riches, but riches did not have Abram. That's pretty hard, isn't it? You see, we're, we're in the world, but not of the world. Abram had riches. That was going to be part of the blessing, we'll see. But riches did not have Abram. And so, uh, we see him passing the test. In this verse, uh, Hebrews 11, 6 is very important, as we see. It says, uh, For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek thee. You see, uh, Abram's mindset is the tent, the altar, and seeking the Lord. That's his priority, when he's right with the Lord. Now, He's separated from Lot here. Look to what it says there in verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after Lot was separated from him. And that's significant, okay? Um, it, it's, it's then, uh, then the Lord says to Abram, look up. Okay, look up. And we'll see how that is important later as we make a point or an application on separation. But for right now, we'll save that for the end. But I want you to see the reward of Abram's faith, of his obedience, of his submission, of his sacrifice, of, of his humility. Now, uh, it says, look at what? First of all, the land. There in verse 14. Lift up now thine eyes. Remember, Lot lift up his eyes earlier. And I wonder what, you know, Abram was looking at. <laughs> but now he says, look up. Okay? And uh, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. For the first thing, the Lord says to, to Abram, look at what you have. The, the, the land is yours. Check out the dimensions. As far as you can see northward, as far as you can see southward, east and west. Abram says, why you go to the right or go to the left? God says, Abram, wherever you look, wherever you look, I'll be, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. Now, this is the, you know, God is, this is a, what we call an application or expansion of the Abrahamic covenant. Uh, back in Genesis 12. I'll just show you that for me. Look at verse 2 and 3. You see, the Lord has already promised Abraham the land, a seed, a blessing. Okay? And as, as you see Abraham exercising faith and obedience, God gives him new revelation. 
Remember I said, when God gives you new revelation, what happens? He tests you on that. Whether you're going to believe him on that. Whether you're going to obey him on that. And that's what God is doing with Abram. So in Genesis 12, um, look at verse 2 and 3 for a minute. And I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all the family of the earth shall be blessed. Okay? And then we look at, uh, in verse 7, and you see, uh, verse 7 is after Abraham believes, or he, he comes out of Ur of Chaldeans, he's, he's in the land now. Uh, he's, he's, he's obeying. And in verse 7, And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there built he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And so, uh, the land, okay, it says, I will give thee. Now it's interesting, there's a progression here. In, in Genesis 12, 1, he says, Let me show you this land. In Genesis 12, 7, I just read that, Unto thy seed will I give thee this land. Now in verse, in, in verse 14 and in uh, verse 17, he says, I'm going to give you this, this land to you, Abram, to thee. I'm going to give it to thee. Verse 17, it says in chapter 13, Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Now notice also, he says also about the blessing is not just the reward, is not just in a sense the land, but it's also the seed. Again, this is an expansion or amplification uh, of the Abrahamic covenant, the I will, God, an unconditional covenant that God has made with Abram. And so he's giving him more insight, more light, okay? Because it's going to get better. Because you, you see in chapter 14, that you're going to see that, that where uh, Abram is going to fight the kings. You're going to see chapter 15, and that's where the, the covenant is, is since ratified. And all that's building up to that, I believe, in chapter 15. And that's Romans chapter 4. See, there's a connection here. But he says, not only look up at the land, but consider the seed. In verse 16, it says, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. You see, we're talking about cohabitants, or co inhabitants or co-inheritants of the land. Uh, I believe this is an eternal, everlasting possession to be, uh, to be uh, in a number among the, the descendants. Uh, it's going to be fully realized in the millennial kingdom. Uh, we, we don't need to say any more than that, but that's where we believe that. Okay, they don't possess the land now. They're on the land, but one day in the millennial kingdom when King Jesus rules and reigns, they will have every step that Abram has stepped on as he walked through that land, eastward, northward, southward, westward. Well, they'll be in complete and everlasting possession. That's what we believe. But let's go on. Remember, Abram had no children as yet. That's why this seed issue is important. Okay? But see, but, but by the eyes of faith, he looks up. See, he beholds God and what God would accomplish. Okay? And then, verse 17, it says, Arise, walk through the land, in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. And it's, it's so amazing. Search out the land. Abram, survey it. In, in the length of it, in the breadth of it. Abram, it's all yours. I promise. I promise. And as he arrives and he walks through the land, see, in faith, Abram walks on the land. In faith, okay? In faith. Finally, in verse 18, Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is the Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. You see, here we see uh, the fitting, really, chain of events. Abram passed the test. You see, uh, his, his test of humility, in a sense, that God's grace is sufficient, uh, putting his rights on hold, as it were, uh, giving Lot the first choice, uh, preferring the brethren. 
You see, that's Christ likeness. That's godliness. That's holy. That's righteousness. That's love. Love. And, and God, in His mercy and grace, rewards Abram. Again, it's not, well, you know, if I do this, God is going to reward. No, no. It's all a matter of grace. Grace. But when God works in you, the will to do His good pleasure, He rewards you. When you do those things that are pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, as we offer up the praises of, uh, of our lips, uh, you know, which is acceptable through Jesus Christ, God rewards us for those things. It's amazing, isn't it? It's mind-boggling. But that's what He does. And so the chain of events here is, first of all, sacrifice, reward, renewed promise, expanded, and then we, we always come to the word worship. If you do anything... If, if you hear the word this morning, if, if you have met with the Lord at all, you see, the expression of your life should be worship. 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 Now, uh, just real quickly, in this word memory, it's, it's the idea of, uh, uh, the meaning of it means vigor, lustily. It means God's blessings, God's promises, God's provisions. Memory. They, he went into, it says, the planes of memory. And, and it has the idea of um, vigor or lustly. Or, or we think about how Abraham laid hold of the promise. Hebron uh, is the word, it means a seat of association or fellowship. Again, again, this is the, the, the hallmark of Abram. I have a tent, I have an altar, I call upon the name of the Lord. And it's interesting, if you turn over to Genesis 18.1, Genesis 18.1 It says, And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory, and he sat in the tent door in the deed of the day. That, that's so good. That's Abram. That's the marks of a believer. He's in fellowship. In fellowship. You see, again, riches did not have Abram, but Abram was rich. We see that God was his portion. We'll see that in a minute. So, in, in, in matter of uh, fellowship, there's worship, there's an altar in verse 18, back in Genesis 13. There's restored fellowship. He passed his test of humility. Uh, there's further revelation and blessing. Let's conclude it this way. The famine was from God, right? About the strife. Remember I asked you last week? I think uh, Acts chapter 2 says, you have, you, you have taken the Lord, it says, through wicked hands you have slain the Lord. You have wicked hands you have taken. What was ordained and predestined by God? He says, you have taken by wicked hands there, Peter is saying. So God use, can use wickedness, can use uh, uh, the hearts of men. He can, he can use the strife, but He's going to use these circumstances, these consequences, uh, these riches, okay, to try Abram. And Abram passed. I think uh, Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, I can't think of the, the verse, he says, uh, there must be heresies among you that those that are approved might be, might be manifested. You see, he they said there are, there, are, there are heresies. There's a difference of opinion a matter of doctrine. The heresy doesn't, when we see the word heresy, sometimes we, we run, oh no, heretics! No, heresy can be different views on doctrine. It can be is that much. But he says there are heresies among you. There must be. Why? Because there are going to be teachers. There are going to be other men of God. There are going to be Christians who are going to stand up and say, hey, the Word says this. You're wrong. In a gracious way. The Word says this. And this is what the Bible teaches. See, God uses that heresy to cleanse, teach, for good. For good. Now, remember I, I said we'd get to the word separation. And it's, and it's very significant, I think, in chapter 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that lot was separated from him. <coughs> now there was an issue, remember, way back in, in Genesis chapter 11. We were talking about Terah. Uh, whether Terah, you know, maybe Abram told Terah, his dad... Uh, you know, God has appeared to me. He's told me to get out of her. You know, come with me. But in, in Genesis 11.32, 32, 
we see that Terah dies in Haran. And so he's, he's, he leaves off uh, his, from his, uh, I think the, the, the uh, patriarchal rule of his dad. He goes, now he's in the land. Remember he said when God called Abram, it was a half-hearted obedience. His family got in the way, in a, in a sense. But see, after Terah dies, he goes into the land. Now we see Abram is left alone. Lot is, is now gone. You see, the promise was to Abram, not to Lot. The covenant was made to Abram, not to Lot. Okay? But we understand that Lot is a believer, too. Okay? But you see, but we, we know the, the overall picture that God is going to what? Uh, bless Abram. He's going to have a son and sons, the 12 nations, 12 sons of Jacob. And then, you know, through that, we're going to have the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, you know, God is working on the small picture and the big picture. God is working out all the minute details down to the last molecule. Amazing. So Abram is separated. And Abram is left alone with God. Now, you know, uh, separation from brethren, separation is, is never, is, you know, you know, we, 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 we just had, uh, not just had, but we worked out uh, by God's grace that the brothers in Ottawa became a local church and, and there were some issues in separation. But overall, I mean, I would say 90% of it was all good. I mean, it was, it, was a, it, was, it was God's timing. And God worked it for good. Was separation nice? Or it should have been okay? But there were, there were issues, okay? But there were small ones in the sense of how we reacted. Okay? If we wanted to make big issues out of it, we could have, right? But we didn't. And they didn't. That's grace. Brother, you see that? That's grace. That's, that's God's wisdom. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. You see? You know, people are watching, right? We're brethren. God gave us grace. I mean, that, that, I, I just... I mean, I'm, I, God gave us grace. Mercy. And uh, I said to, you know, Pastor Tim, we're, we're going to redevelop a church-to-church a, a, a -church relationship now. I think it's good. I think it's growing. That's what God had for us. It was hard, right? Separation. It was hard. But see, God knows that Abram is alone. But I like what... Uh, look at Genesis 15.1. So this is where God is leading you. Abram, you're alone. You're separated from family now. You're, you know, when the... So good that uh, family members could come across the seaway and come up to, to Canada, you know. But there was a, you know, it's a sense when we came up to Canada, it was like the bridge was burnt. You know, we're in Canada now. You know, uh, our family is here basically. It, it's the church family. You know, I love my brothers, I love my family, and things of that sort. But you see, it, it, it cost us something, okay, to come up here. And, and you say, well, you know, uh, during the holidays, uh, we, we, it's a blessing to have our in-laws up. But sometimes we, we don't get down there too often. Grandma's house, we try. But you see, and sometimes it's pretty lonely. And God fills in. How? With Brother George maybe and others. Others, brothers and sisters here, you see. But see, God knows that Abram needs a word, you know. He's by himself. And, and, and God is teaching Abram that, verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1, And then these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Move aside the riches, the cattle, the land, all. Just move that aside. And God says, Abram, I want you to see something. I am your reward. Isn't that true, brother, this morning? You can say to God, to the Lord Jesus, Lord, you're my reward. You're, you're my uh, exceeding great reward. Thou art my shield and my thy exceeding great reward. And it's true. God is moving to strengthen Abram in his faith. Second thing that we see in conclusion here, not only separation, Abram waived his rights. Lot, you choose first. 
Now again, you, you, you think about that for a minute. How that is so against human nature. How that is so against human nature. In Philippians 2.6, it says this. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And speaking of the Lord Jesus. And the idea is that it, there wasn't an internal Godhead struggle. Okay? When the Lord took upon flesh. It's to see, the Lord Jesus, and I explain it this way. The Lord Jesus didn't have an identity crisis after he took on flesh. You see, he, he knew for sure, 100%, he was God. He knew that he was the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. He knew that he was in complete fellowship with the Father. And there was nothing that was going to separate him from the Father. In that sense of, of as, as the Son. You know, the cross and, and his redemptive work, things like that. But you see, it says, um, and Paul, who being, not, being in the form of God, being very God and very man, though it not, God had not robbery, meaning he did not have to clutch onto his identity and say, this is mine. It's my right. I'm God. He was just like, he was at peace with himself. I'm God. I'm God. They don't believe that. But I, I don't have an internal conflict with that. That's what Paul's saying there. Okay? And see how Abram is so much like the Lord Jesus. Isn't that true? In this instance, test of humility. You see, the king, the heir, is rejected and crucified by the nation of Israel. He could have commanded 12 legion of angels. Couldn't he? Just one probably could have taken care of it. But he said, no, no, no. Our Lord gave up the right of fair treatment. He gave up the, the right of a fair trial. Well, that's a study in itself, looking at the, 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 all the Roman laws that were broken to try the Lord Jesus as they did. Not only for the Sanhedrin, but for Pilate and Herod. Our Lord gave up the right of fair treatment. He gave up the right of a fair trial. He, he, he gave up the enormous amount of rightful honor, praise, and worship. He put that all aside. What do we do when we have to face strife? What do we do when we have to face the lots in our world? The brothers and sisters. Do we demand our rights? You know, isn't that isn't so, so natural for husbands and wives to demand rights and children to, from the parents? I'm, I want my rights. But the Lord Jesus said, no. I, 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 I relinquished voluntarily. That, and it's a very important word. The Lord Jesus voluntarily gave up those rights. You know, he did he didn't cease being God. He just ceased being... He's always been God. I mean, in a sense, he, 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 he uh, uh, said, no, I'm not going to exercise the prerogatives of deity. That's God. He could have turned the stones in, into bread, but it wasn't God's will. It wasn't His Father's will. He was going to what? God's grace was going to be sufficient. He's going to walk by faith. He's going to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And God the Father is going to provide for the Lord Jesus, His Son. That's what He does for us. That's what He did for Abram. Relinquish my own rights in humility for the betterment and promotion of others. I, I, I don't know if that's... Uh, I'm glad I, I see uh, brothers and sisters doing that. I'm not just going to be negative. But I can say, boy, we, we should need a dose of that today, don't we, in our church? In our churches? Relinquish my rights in humility for the betterment and promotion of others. And I want to tell you that God will not let such Christ-likeness go unrewarded. The Lord says, He that humbles himself shall be exalted. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, be servant of all. That's what Abram's doing. Lot's choice, the Lord says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these things 
shall be added unto you. And I mentioned it before, but the Corinthians, could you imagine? I'm taking a good brother. You know, there's a disagreement. Maybe it's a, a business transaction or a land deal or, you know, someone sold me this car, you know, a brother and sister, and it's a junker or it was a lemon, you know. Instead of going to the church, and putting it before the church, going to the brother first, right? We, we have what the scriptures tell us. You know, if you have a, if your brother offended, you go to your brother. Work it out. If that doesn't work, you take one or two witnesses. If that doesn't work, you bring it before the church. And the Corinthians, I mean, what, 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 uh, you know, they didn't, you know, they had Christians there, I believe, that could have handled those situations, don't you think? Why? Because God's grace is sufficient. God's wisdom is available, not only to Abram, but to us also. The third thing here is, uh, and as we think of uh, something in closing, you know, we often, the Lord told us to remember Lot's wife, right? Remember Lot's wife. But I want to say this morning, remember Lot. Remember Lot. Remember Lot. But follow, imitate Abram. As he walks in faith, it's tried faith, it's overcoming faith. But dear ones, remember we said, we, we mentioned this in the evening services, through, we're going through the Sermon on the Mount in the last chapter 7. You see, uh, faith is going to work by love. And that's what we see in Abraham. And he passes the test. Why? Because God's grace is sufficient. God's wisdom is there. And he does, he does uh, Abram does what, what, how many of us would have done that honestly? Maybe we, that's something you could take home and think about. When we remember Lot, well, Lot, you know, I got this good choice, man. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the best. I'm going to take the best. And God sees that. Abram says, no, you can have first choice, brother. And God rewards him. Lot had to go somewhere, right? Think about that for a minute. God just wanted Abram to be alone with him. So remember Lot, but imitate Abram, faith that worketh by love, and finally two verses, and I'll pray. The Lord says this, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Abram passed the test. He humbled himself. He saw that God's grace was sufficient. He saw that uh, God's wisdom was sufficient. He let Lot choose. Lot separates. And God blesses. <coughs> And then, you know what? Chapter 14, there's another test. In chapter 15, see, there's another test. There are 12 different tests. And they get harder as you, we go on into Abram's life. You see, a, the faith that justifies is a faith that's going to be tried. And tried. And tried. And it's going to come forth as gold. And, and just like that verse says, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you're lost this morning, I plead with you. The Lord is the only great reward. I mean, Lot, think, you know, you look at Lot and you say, wow. He ended up in a cave. He could have been still walking with Abel. Still having God's blessing. But I want to ask you, whatever the world will offer you, young person, adult, is nothing compared to the Lord Jesus. And yes, it's going to cost you something to come to the Lord Jesus. It's going to cost you your, your rights, your sin, your life. He that seeketh 
to gain his life shall lose it. But he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. That's what the Lord Jesus says. So I encourage you, young people, don't know the Lord. Flee to him. Trust him. There's nothing that this world can offer that's going to compare when you stand in his presence. We'll talk about that a little bit more tonight. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this example of Abram. Thank you, Lord, that when we fail, you give us another test. You give us grace. You don't leave us alone. And uh, you want us to pass the test. And we understand this morning it's all for your glory and honor and praise and, and for our good. Father, I pray that we would examine our hearts this morning, whether we're walking the steps of Lot or are we walking the steps of Abram. Give us grace to be honest with ourselves. And give us grace, Lord, to trust you and believe your word. And whatever light you have given to us, whatever you would have us to do, Lord, whether it's ministry in the church or in our families, the revealed will of God before us, oh, let us do it heartily unto the Lord. For we serve the Lord, not men. We thank you for this time. Bless now, we pray. In Jesus' name.